Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the, to the final dinner, uh, the final event of the uh, Global Innovations and Energy Conference. Again, I just want to thank you all for your participation, for all of the great dialogue, all of the uh, great presentations, and the great networking. And just let me say it's been a privilege uh, for me to get to know a lot of you a little better today and to, to make new friends. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, and start our keynotes. So this will be a working dinner, uh, in a sense. Uh, of course, we get to enjoy our dinner while our keynote speaker works, so, so that'll, be a, that'll be a new experience. I want to introduce to you Rim Wooten. Rim Wooten is a, is a good friend of the center, a good friend of the University of North Carolina. He has passion uh, for this place. Uh, he, he knows the, the Tar Heel way very well, uh, with the exception of when he was a youth. I'm going to tell you a story about Rim Wooten that uh, is unknown. Um, in his earlier days living in Cary, Rim was uh, best friends with our own Brett Lane, who works in the Keenan Institute. And uh, I got an email from Brett earlier this week who said, please tell Rim that I remember the day when he hit me in the head with a rock uh, when we were five years old. So evidently, Rim's got a good arm, too, and good accuracy and aim. He tells me he does have rocks in his pocket, so do not go to sleep uh, tonight. Without further ado, Rim Wooten. Thank you, Al. I realized a little bit earlier today that I was violating one of my cardinal rules, which I'm fixing to rectify. Uh, I have a rule that the only time I wear a tie is when I'm at a religious event or when I'm asking somebody for money. I don't think there's much chance of this turning into a religious event, and I don't think anybody here is going to give me any money. So the first thing I'm going to do is lose the tie. <clears throat> um, one thing I'm not going to do uh, is, is talk a lot about my company. Uh, there have been a lot of people during the course of the conference whose job was to talk about their company, uh, but I've decided to choose a little bit different path. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the industry than the company. I'll describe my company this way. We're a technology company. We have a gasification technology. And I would describe it as magical and revolutionary. Of course, somebody's already sort of beat us to that description of a product they just came out with here in a few, few weeks ago. Uh, and so I'm going to come back to that character, actually, a little bit at the end of the speech. Uh, what I'd like to talk about uh, mostly, and, and that because it's the theme of this conference and the theme of the CSE, is innovation. Uh, the innovation that I'm most familiar with personally is in the energy sector. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what I see going on there and what we see going on going forward. Uh, but my first exposure to innovation uh, in a university setting was at this school. Uh, I graduated here, uh, despite my violent tendencies, I graduated here in 1981, in May, uh, in the spring. And five months later, I found myself back at the medical school. Uh, not because I was enrolling in the medical school to become a doctor, but because I became a patient. And they determined that I had uh, a stage four cancer which even as we stand here today is more often than not a death sentence. And certainly. That any better? Okay. Can you hear me now, Bill? You're on Verizon now. I'm on Verizon now. Okay. Uh, Tracy tells me to say that again. So I found myself at the medical center five months after I graduated from this place as a patient. And they diagnosed me as a stage four cancer patient, which, uh, as most of you know, even today is more often than not a death sentence. Uh, and in 1981, it certainly was. And so they, they showed me the array of treatment options, which ranged from bad to horrible. And they told me that they had just in the last 18 months or so identified one toxic cocktail that actually sort of halfway kind of worked on some people. Uh, it was not any fun, but it was sort of the only realistic option. So I did that. And the reason I tell you that story uh, is because you, you do that and you become a very optimistic person. You start to believe that things that, you know, maybe other people don't believe will happen will. And so that left me with sort of two legacies. 
I guess I might have had the one before that, but it made me a very optimistic person, and so I'm going to cast a very optimistic tone talking about the energy sector. And it made me a little bit impatient. Maybe I was a little bit impatient before, but it made me really impatient because when you're sort of doing things on borrowed time, you become more impatient. And I think that's what we're doing with the Earth today. We're, we're kind of living on borrowed time here, and you can hear the undercurrent in the speakers in this conference. It's like, can we get started already? You know, it's, it's time to put this show on the road and to put the innovations into this sector that will, will change the world that we live in. And so I want to give you a perspective, at least as I see this, this world, for how it is changing and, and actually how quickly it is changing, even without us really noticing it. Now, I've got a chart here that most of you can't possibly read, but that's okay. You'll recognize immediately that this is a business school quality chart. <laughs> it was developed by the World Resource Institute two years ago, spring two years ago, not 15 minutes ago, but two years ago. And what they did is they tried to quantify policy options in the transportation sector and in the electric power sector for improving our country from a climate point of view, from an energy uh, an environmental point of view, and from an energy security point of view. So the place, as you well know, that you always want to live on one of these charts is in the upper right-hand quadrant. You want to be doing the things that make their way to that quadrant. The major initiatives, policy initiatives they see in the electric center, uh, sector are blue. The major initiatives or possible initiatives in the transportation sector are in green. And so you see things like in the lower left-hand corner of this slide, don't try to read it, I'll tell you what's in it, that says freezing miles per gallon for light duty vehicles at 2005 levels. Now, as you probably know, last month there was signed into fact the legislation that raised that standard as of 2016 by 10.4 miles per gallon, I think, if I remember correctly. The bubble in the far right-hand side of this page, the largest bubble on the page, the most useful thing that they perceived two years ago that we could do for our economy is raise fuel economy standards for cars by 10 miles per gallon. And damn if we didn't do it. That's exactly what got done as a part of the sequence when we went through the, the trauma that we went through with the auto companies. That change alone saves three million barrels of oil a day once it's fully implemented and up and running. 15% of everything we use in this country, 30% of everything we use in the, in, in the automotive sector. So it, it's that sort of change that has occurred without a climate change bill. It was two years ago, arguably sort of a, a fantasy to get something like that implemented. And so in all the carnage that's, that, that occurred as our economy stumbled and the things that, that happened occurred, some things are getting done. I'll come back to this at the end and sort of tell you where I think we are now. But this is where we were two years ago assessing policy options in those two sectors. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about a little bit is where does electricity come from? But I'm not going to answer it first the way it's on this chart. There was a study done a couple of years ago where they polled typical folks, not, not the kind of folks that are in this room and that are knowledgeable about this sort of sector, but people in the economy uh, at, at large. One of these things where they sort of test the knowledge base of the American public. And that when they asked the question, where does electricity come from? The number one answer to that question was the wall. <laughs> I'm not joking. Electricity comes from the wall. Can you hear me okay? Um, so there, there are corollaries to that that are, that are pertinent to where I'm going here. Um, we don't know switching to agriculture for a second. Most people are so completely disassociated with where things come from that they don't have a clue. I suspect if you guys went home, the ones who are about my vintage, who have kids that are 10, 15, 20, 25 years old, if you go home and ask your kids where strawberries come from, just to pick a random example, you might get an answer like the refrigerator or the grocery store or some of them probably know that they come from plants. Some of you may even grow those kinds of plants. We do at my house. The kids are puzzled by why we'd want to grow some of our own food when we could just 
go to the grocery store and get it. But I bet you if you ask them, when do you pick strawberries? You'd have very few of them that could answer that question. Maybe some, some of us can't answer that question. I remember it because my parents made me do it. My kids will remember it because I made them do it. But in their world, they have strawberries 365 days a year. They don't go out in the backyard and pick them. And that dissociation leaves people you know, in a place where it's very hard for them to understand you know, all this nonsense that goes on in Washington. We talk about energy policies and immigration policies and other things that they have not a good comprehension of. And, and I think uh, Jim Rogers made a point last night that uh, one of the failings in getting energy legislation through Congress has been that uh, as we've tried to push it through, it started out as an environmental initiative. People perceive it to be an environmental initiative. And as he also pointed out last night, there's a subset of people that care about polar bears floating around on chunks of ice, but it's not the population at large that cares about that. And so as we move through and try to understand the world around us and do something about it, we've got to find a way to articulate things that people can understand. They understand, you know, at a basic level that buying oil from people who don't like us is a bad idea. And so the idea of changing the fuel efficiency standards of their automobiles, if they start to understand that that takes money from pockets in the Middle East and puts it in their pockets, well, that's not such a bad idea after all. Maybe they don't like it quite as much as their big powerful car, but they can begin to get in tune with it. And so as you think about changing the electric sector, for instance, and some of the really profound changes we have to make, I start with a simple quantification of it. You've heard it at the conference before. Uh, about half of the electricity in this country comes from coal. Uh, you can see where the other pieces are. And about 80% of the carbon emissions from the electric sector are from the coal-fired portion. The balance is from natural gas, which has about half the carbon footprint as coal, and which uh, accounts for about 40% of the generation of coal. So there's a couple of facts that will be pertinent here in a second. Now, I did a calculation just for funsies to try to quantify the, uh, the challenge that we've got here. Historically in this country, growth in GDP and energy consumption has basically been a one-to-one -one correlation. If the economy grows 2 or 3% a year, electric consumption grows 2 or 3% a year. So let's think about what we've got to do by 2050 to knock 80% out of the carbon content of the electric sector. If the country grows at according to my calculator, 2.319% per year. In the year 2050, it'll be 250% of what it is today. So in order to hold carbon emissions constant, assuming we use the same kind of facilities we do today, you'd have to have an economy that's 60% more energy efficient than it is today. I think a lot of people actually believe that's possible. I do. But it's a big number. You have to shrink consumption by an amount equal to one and a half times what we use today in the aggregate. It's a big number. The other thing you would have to do is you would essentially have to make carbon emissions from coal-fired power zero, since that already accounts for 80% of the sector. If you're going to reduce it by 80%, there's kind of a place to start. The next thing you'd have to do is, within those constraints, is you'd somehow have to figure out how to fuel the electrification of our transportation sector. So these are enormous challenges. This is not about you know, tweaking things a little bit here and there. Um, you've heard from a number of other speakers you know, uh, points of view about how do we get to where we're going from where we are. Uh, the first thing you have to have is a real societal commitment. And that's why I went through that story about you, you, people have to buy into this. They have to understand that it's, that it's a good idea to use energy efficiently and to go about doing it. We're not talking, you know, Jimmy Carter and the cardigan sweater and freezing in your home. We're talking about making it more efficient, not making it less, less comfortable. We've clearly got one way or another, we've talked about this at length, to put a price on carbon, a price that, you know, discourages us from doing things we shouldn't do and encourages us to do things we should. Economics 101. Uh, the other thing is that there's really only, uh, Jim characterized five places to get, get this from. I've condensed it to four. The first is efficiency. 
I talked about what you'd need to do from an efficiency point of view to change the economy. And then all of the others are supply side options, nuclear, renewables, and what I'm calling carbon capture and storage, which is basically taking any kind of fossil fuel generation, pulling all the carbon out of it and sticking it in the ground. That's the only way that you can make emissions from coal or natural gas zero. You've got to capture it, and stick it in the ground, or turn it into some sort of a product. Now, there is, to digress for a second, there's a corollary to this in the healthcare system. I read an interesting article the other day, an interview with the head of the, the UCLA Medical Center. And he said when he walks around his facility, his hospital, 50% of the people who are there <coughs> are there from self-inflicted damage. They're there for the lifestyle they lead, for the diet they eat, for the, for the sedentary ways that they do things, for drugs, for all sorts of things that are essentially self-inflicted damage. Most of us do some of those things to one degree or another. Some people do them to a very extreme degree. And he says, you know, if you, we can have this long debate about you know, how we're going to get more doctors and how we're going to manage the system. He said, but you know, if you really wanted to change this equation, the first thing you would do is reduce demand. You would like get people to behave a little bit and make themselves healthy. But I think that also tells you how daunting this challenge of efficiency is in the energy sector because you've got the same challenge in the healthcare sector. And if you can't get people to like eat the right things and exercise a little bit occasionally and not smoke and not drink to excess, not do drugs to excess, it's going to be really hard to convince them that the polar bears are their first concern. You know, you've got to find a way to, to make that sale to people. Now, why am I so optimistic about this? I sound pessimistic, don't I? The reason I'm optimistic is because I think that the innovation in the energy sector that I've seen from the vantage point of working in a private equity group, the innovation in the last 10 years is more than probably in the last 50 or 75. I think the innovation in the next 10 will probably be more than the last 100. I really do genuinely believe that. and so. I just took the same categories I just talked about, efficiency, nuclear, renewables, and the whole carbon capture and storage thing, and just flipped through what has come into the public domain just in the last month or so, for examples. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with what's called the Bloom Box. This is a solid oxide fuel cell developed by Bloom Energy. They come in 100 kilowatt modules. They've got the first commercial scale units uh, up and running at places like Google out on the West Coast. And they basically had to come out of the closet with this really before they wanted to because their customers were demanding that they do it, that they get the, the recognition for the things they're doing with their facilities. Uh, a fuel cell, as most of you know, your run-of-the-mill fuel cell, is twice as efficient as an internal combustion engine in a transportation application. Uh, and it's materially more efficient than the electric grid is today by the time you process fuels and stick it in a transmission line and run it through a distribution line and jazz the voltage up and down and stick it in your house. A fuel cell is a very efficient way to do electricity. And I'm not saying that their technology or any of these others that I'm mentioning here are winners. I'm not smart enough to pick all the winners. What I'm saying, though, is that there are innovations here occurring by real companies with enormous backing and who know how to take those technologies and commercialize them if there's a structure in place that enables it. Uh, you know, the, the, the structures that have been developed in California for the computer industry to drive cost out of things, what Henry Ford did, you know, 100 years ago, you put those things together and you start mass producing these gizmos, uh, and the next thing you know, there's a whole different cost structure. Uh, there's another technology that's been, you know, that people who are in this business know about but this has been sort of, you know, on the periphery for a long time. Uh, Intellectual Ventures, which is run by the former head of technology at Microsoft, is partially backed by Bill Gates. They are trying to commercialize with Toshiba, also a pretty decent company. They're trying to commercialize, commercialize the traveling wave nuclear reactor. And I don't even begin to understand how it works, but I know what the upshot of it is. The upshot of it is that rather than creating a waste stream that's problematic and that you don't really want just anybody to get their hands on, 
they can actually take today's waste stream and use that as part of the fuel input. And they conceptualize that these plants can run 40, 50, 100 years, some of them. Are they right? I don't know. But they're going to spend a few billion dollars trying to figure it out. And if they do, think about what they'll do. They'll have a zero carbon source of electricity. It will use existing stockpiles of high level problematic waste. It will take that out of the stream that you know, not very nice people would like to lay their hands on. And so it's not just an energy security solution, it's a national security solution. Uh, there are other things like uh, ocean energy. There's a new, uh, relatively new group forum called the Ocean Energy Institute that's sponsored by Matt Simmons, who's one of the leading peak oil theorists. Uh, I know that Duke and uh, the school here are working on some, some uh, coastal wind power kind of applications. And again, I'm not trying to pick winners and don't know which ones of these things are work or going to be the most economic. But I can tell you that the amount of intellectual capital and the amount of hard capital that's going into them is enormous. The last thing I reference here is an interesting one. Uh, this is not from the coal industry. It's not from you know uh, people that really you would think have a vested interest in doing something with fossil fuels. Uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council just released a study that they sponsored on carbon capture and storage, carbon capture and sequestration, where they believe that with widespread implementation of that in the power sector, that there's the potential to produce another 3 million barrels of oil a day in the United States and simultaneously be sequestering a lot of the carbon that comes out of the electric sector. Now, that's interesting, too. That number, by the way, that supply side option where we make use of a waste that we don't want going into the atmosphere and pry oil out of a place that we like, our home turf, that's a three million barrel a day kind of solution, at least in their estimation. You couple that with what I showed you on the bubble chart from the World Resource Institute, that was also a three million barrel a day solution. That one's a very high probability. Once you build the cars and they get that fuel economy, you'll get that three million barrels a day of savings. Well, the two of those together, just those two things, are six million barrels a day. We only produce eight in this country. It's 30% of the total that we use, and it's approximately equal to the amount that we buy from bad people, or people that we perceive to be bad people. So, you know, that would take an enormous effort, but there's a tremendous payoff for it that's, that's, that's tangible and understandable. And I think by the time that you get the Natural Resources Defense Council advocating that technology, that solution, you know, it tells you that its time has sort of arrived, that this might not be a bad idea. Now, back to the bubble chart. Um, again, I don't expect anybody to be able to read this, but you can see the colors have changed. That's fun. And most of the bubbles now are in the upper right-hand side of the page. So what I've done is I've taken those uh, demand and supply sources, efficiency, nuclear, renewables, and fossil-based systems, and I've recolored the chart. So the ones that, you know, score pretty big on, the, on where you want to be, in the upper right-hand column, on the efficiency front are the change to the automotive standards, that's the big yellow bubble, building efficiency, second largest bubble on the page, and plug-in hybrids, which we already have to some extent and are accelerating the development of. So those look like pretty good ideas. Uh, nuclear is that orange one that sort of straddles the uh, uh, energy security line. But as I mentioned a minute ago, if we start to adopt technologies like what Bill Gates is developing, that orange bubble starts to move straight across the page and percolate up a little bit. Because all of a sudden, we've got, we're going from acquiring a finite fuel that's located elsewhere to acquiring one we have a whole bunch of right here that we'd like to make go away. Uh, renewables is in green. Uh, moving from left to right toward the bottom, you have solar, which is the smallest one, wind, which is the next one, cellulosic ethanol, which has sort of attached itself to the uh, light duty vehicle bubble. And down at the bottom, we have what for all intents and purposes constituted our energy policy for the last eight years, corn ethanol, crop-based ethanol. It still sort of kind of halfway works, uh, and at least we produce it here. So that's what you get from that. And then the two uh, blue bubbles 
are uh, new clean coal plants with, that are equipped with carbon capture and the carbon capture and storage from old coal plants. The things that I've drawn slashes through are things that, in my view, have been sort of summarily uh, attacked. Uh, one is not changing mileage standards. One is increasing oil imports. One is coal to liquids with no carbon capture. And I also drew a line through the LNG one, which is the big one just to the left of center. Uh, and that's because with all the new horizontal drilling technology that we've developed, yes, there's still questions about it. There's no doubt about that. But you can make a, a plausible argument that the natural gas needs that we have in this country, we're now much better equipped to meet than we thought we were even two or three years ago. Two or three years ago, we were running out of supply. The conventional stuff was tanking. Natural gas was 12 or $13 an MMBTU. Today, it's four. Actually, it's a little bit less than four. And so, you know, in a very short period of time, with no overarching legislation that drives it, but simply with the, the concerted actions of the business community, basically, in concert with the NGOs, in concert with at least some state and local governments, we've began to push this whole chart in the direction that it needs to go. Each, the bubbles are sort of migrating to where they belong. You can argue about the size and shape and configuration and timing of each one of them. You can advocate solar more than ocean power. But the market will actually sort that kind of stuff out if you set in motion a scheme that enables it. Uh, and and what I, I guess what I was struck by when I go back and look at this is that in two years' time, two short years' time, we've made those sorts of changes without the governmental in intervention. And so if you get even a, a halfway credible set of actions out of Washington sooner or later, it'll be amazing, I think, the pace at which this goes. So I have just a couple of final thoughts before uh, Mark and I do our thing. Um, and it goes something like this. I think really the, 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 the balance that we see in the world is, is a contest between human nature, which is you know, inherently uh, flawed, and human ingenuity, right? And I think for, for a very long time, human nature has had the upper hand. And you know, we've got the evidence of that in our environment and all across the planet, and it's, it's becoming hard to deny at any level that it exists and that we've really got to do something about it. And that's especially true if you look at the scarcity of all kinds of resources, not just energy resources, but land, uh, arable land, and food, and water in particular. You could do a whole session on what the hell we're going to do when you know, the water supply isn't what it should be. Uh, and human ingenuity can solve all of that. You, know, you just have to create a system that unleashes it. And then the last thing I put down here, not to offend anybody, at least not on purpose, is, is a, a business story that I remember well. Half the people in this room weren't born when it materialized, but I think it's actually more pertinent today than it was then. And it's when Steve Jobs was interviewing John Scully, who was the president of Pepsi in the early 1980s, 1983, if my memory serves me correctly. And he asked him, you know, did he want to spend the rest of his career selling carbonated sugar water to children, or did he want to change the world? And I think that's like, you know, if I was in the MBA school, or anywhere else for that matter, that's the kind of question I'd be asking myself now. You know, if you look at those two companies, their two business models, I've not gone and checked the numbers, but I'm pretty sure this is true. If you look at Pepsi, and you look at Apple, and you looked at what their, you know, compound annual return has been for the last 27 years, I bet they would both be pretty impressive. I bet they would both beat the S&P 500, okay? And they both have, in their own way, changed the world. Apple in ways that are uh, magical and revolutionary, uh, as their new device is. And, you know, Pepsi has done its thing to change the world as well. They've certainly created some opportunities in the healthcare sector. But it's not just their doing. It's, it's, you know, it's human nature that's making that decision, right? I like potato chips and Pepsi. I like Coke better. But I like those sorts of things, and I suspect everybody in here eats them from time to time. And so I think, you know, that's, I think we find ourselves at, a, at a, an inflection point here in the world where 
you know, it's sort of about kind of time to do something about this stuff. And so that's, uh, that's my story. I'm optimistic about it, and I'm sticking to it. glad we're going to end the event on an optimistic note. I will try not to throw too much cold water on your optimism. Um, I'm also not going to come to the defense of Pepsi. I guess there are a lot of Coke loyalists since we're south of the Mason-Dixon line here, but they're actually doing a lot of good work around issues of sustainability. So, Let me start with your last point about human nature and human ingenuity. <clears throat> Aside from government and technology, the other, one of the other levers we do have to deal with this issue of sustainability is human behavior. Yep. And as, as easy as, as it is to poke fun of Jimmy Carter and the cardigan yep. um, because it didn't work, uh, you've heard the statistics about how much we consume in this country, um, how that rate of consumption is fundamentally unsustainable. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with your other point about connections. We don't realize when we plug in our iPod or iPad that half of the energy, if we listen for two hours, comes from burning coal. Um, we don't think about the carbon impact of a hamburger. Um, I think next time you do your conference, Jessica, we have to serve some more vegetarian food and uh, a little less meat. But again, we're in the South here. So my question. <laughs> My question, my question for you, Rem, is what opportunities do you think there are for changing the way people think about energy and consumption issues and essentially using you know, the techniques of behavioral economics to uh, help move us in a more sustainability, sustainable direction? Well, I, I think, um, I mean, frankly, I think human beings are you know, subject to a lot of, of uh, cause and effect kind of laws. And one of them is that they respond to incentives, right? People like to do things that the government gives them incentives to do uh, because they like to not send taxes to the government. So tax incentives of various sorts actually do work. They cause people to buy more efficient heat pumps and do that kind of stuff. Uh, the other thing they really respond to, though, is prices. You know, uh, price elasticity uh, actually exist in, in a lot of products. You know, the things we learned in Econ 101, there's some, some merit to them. And, and I think, you know, you've got to send price signals to them that they can embrace and respond to and do something about. And so if you start to put a price on carbon and that shows up in their electric bill, they get that, right? As do the producers. Uh, and if you start to give uh, incentives uh, on the other side, you know, subsidies or, or whatever to cause good things to happen, I think people respond to that. Now, having said that, you know, the, the incentives to change personal behavior, whether it's in your diet, the foods that you eat, or your energy consumption patterns or whatever, you know, it, it's difficult work. You know, it's very hard to get people to change behavior. Uh, but the one thing that they as respond to in a market economy is, you know, is price, is, is incentives to do things and disincentives to do other things. So I don't think government or business can do this, but do you think there's any institutions out there that could get people to think about the social and environmental impact of the cars they drive, the size of the houses we have? I mean, the <laughs> fact that essentially we are, you know, the world's by far uh, you know, leading consumers and, for that matter, wasters as well. It's yeah. it's got to be price. You think? I think I think price is part of it. I, I, I saw there was an interesting chart in um, I think it was in Al Gore's most recent book where he. Uh, you can use this here. Don't worry about it. Is it working? Yeah. There was an interesting uh, chart in Al Gore's book where he talked about change in behavior for smoking. And he showed the uh, decline curve for smoking in the United States over like a, I think it was about a 40-year time period. 
Uh, and there were really two points to it. One is that even after we came to understand how profoundly bad an idea it is to smoke, there are still a lot of people who do it. And they do it in, in copious uh, amounts. But the, the optimistic part of it was, but yet yeah, once people figure it out, and once you start to, among other things, price it, right? Jacking up the price of tobacco, the behavior does slowly but ever so surely change. Uh, and I think, you know, we're looking at that kind of a curve, say, in the energy sector. There's no way this stuff's going to occur overnight for a whole variety of reasons. You know, will it take 40 years? I don't know. It might take two or three generations to really, truly change people's behavior. But the combination of, of knowledge and understanding, you know, as you begin to inform people about what they're really doing and what the consequences of it are, and as you price the hell out of it, I think, uh, you know, will <laughs> we'll over time change people's behavior. Well, I don't want to get too philosophical here, but, you know, the other example that's often used is seat belts, which became mm -hmm. kind of common practice yep. through social marketing and peer pressure. And when you look at the dramatic changes in this country around issues like women, gay rights, and race relations with a black president, you know, 30 years after the Civil Rights Act, you, you yep. could argue that it's possible to dramatically change yep. the way people think about some very basic things in their life. Absolutely. And, and you, I mean, you can see it in all the elements of life that you mentioned and a whole bunch more. Yeah. So pricing does require the government to get involved. Um, can this clean energy revolution happen without strong legislation, higher price for fossil fuels, and what do you think the prospects are for getting that hap making that happen? We've certainly been talking about it for a decade at least. Right. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the bubble chart sort of shows you in a visual way that the forces are lining up to do it, right, the technologies and policies that would actually work. But what you're also seeing is a lot of it is not, in fact, happening other than the vehicle standards. Um, you know, whether it's putting carbon capture and storage projects in place or nuclear plants or uh, some of the uh, things like geothermal power, uh, some of the other renewables. You've got to have the incentives in place. You've got to have pricing mechanisms in place that make it economic, or people won't do it. They will amass the capital to develop the technologies and get ready to deploy them. But you know, if at the end of the day, there's not a system there that accommodates it, they won't do it unless they can make money at it. And I know, you know from uh, looking at these sectors, uh, the, the price of the supply side options of nuclear power, of coal with carbon capture and storage, and of a lot of the renewables is a multiple of the existing cost structure. Uh, I think uh, Jim Rogers, I think, mentioned last night that, you know, the average cost of electricity in this country last year was right at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, $100 a megawatt hour. When you break that down, if my memory serves me correctly, about 60% of that is the production part of the equation. It's generating the electricity with those various sources. And the other 40, $40, 40% 40 is delivering it. So the cost of that electricity to produce is about 60 bucks a megawatt hour if you average it out all over the country. Um, the cost of this new stuff we're talking about is, you know, in many cases is a multiple of that. There's a uh, coal gasification based project in Illinois that's public knowledge. Somebody mentioned it earlier today. It's Tanaska's Taylorville project. Uh, it's public record what they filed, what the cost of that power will be. The best case scenario is about $120 a megawatt hour, twice what our system costs today. And the top end of it is about 150 bucks. So that's two and a half times what the sort of the existing stuff costs. So that's not going to happen unless somebody pays for it, right? Nobody, no investor is going to do that out of altruism. So, all right, so part one, you answered the first part of the question, which is no, it's not going to happen without the right policy. Not in any dramatic way, no. So then the second part of the question is what are the prospects for getting the right policy anytime soon? Well, I should strike an optimistic tone on that. Um, I think, uh, and, and we're very much involved in this, you know, on the uh, legislative side, uh, I, I'm a whole lot more optimistic, really, than I was a few months ago. It looked DOA at that point. Uh, I would say it's 50-50 we get something this year. And I, if you ask me for a cumulative probability that we get something by the end of next year, I'd say it's 75%. Hmm. I say that in part because I don't, I just hope <laughs> 
maybe it's just hope, not optimism. I hope we're not stupid enough to not do it. I, you know, I hope as a society that we've got good enough sense to get our arms around this and to do the things that are necessary for energy security, for environmental, and in particular for job creation, because it will do all three. Okay. I really hope you're right about that. I do too. <laughs> So we talked about consumers a little. We talked about government policy. Let's talk a little about technology and specifically about um, your company, which is okay. one reason you're here. So what is Allied Syngas and explain what BGL gasification technology is sure. in about in, in a level that, you know, say an intelligent MBA or not so intelligent reporter could understand? Well, one of those is a lower threshold. Right? Yeah, I know. Um, uh, Allied Sun Gas uh, has a proprietary uh, gasification technology. It's principally used for coal, uh, but it can, uh, it can be used for anything carbonaceous, uh, any kind of biomass or uh, plastics or shredded tires or anything else that has uh, carbon content and that can be put into some sort of pelletized or sizable form. Uh, we can take that product and scrub out of it essentially all of the bad things and then make uh, derivative products that are very clean. So we can pull the mercury out of it, we can pull the sulfur out of it, which are the two principal bad things embedded in coal, and uh, through uh, various processes can pull substantially all of the carbon dioxide created through the use of coal out of it to stick into the ground. Um, we're working on a project in North Dakota, for instance, uh, that will essentially have a zero carbon footprint. Uh, we'll use coal. We will clean about 92% of this carbon out of the coal in the process. And we will put enough biomass into the project to offset the little bit of residual carbon emissions there are. So with about a 10% biomass mix and 90% coal, we can build a coal-based power project that has a zero carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. That's basically what we do is we try to commercialize and deploy that technology around the world. Uh, we have uh, projects with third parties in China and in India and in Africa, uh, and we're working on projects in Brazil, for example, using biomass and, and elsewhere. So are you building these plants or are you licensing technology to utility companies that build them? Uh, a little bit of both. Uh, the projects in, in China are actually chemical plants. Uh, one of them produces ammonia, which they use for fertilizer for agricultural purposes. Uh, the other one produces a synthesis gas that they use in a steel making operation. Uh, and they own it. In that case, we're providing engineering services and process licenses. But we don't build own and operate those plants. The one in Africa will make transportation fuels. Uh, and again, we're, we're not an owner in that project. We're a provider of technology. Uh, the project we're working on in North Dakota is one that we don't. And is, so this comes under the heading of cleaner coal, essentially. You're taking a dirty fuel and you're using it in ways that strip the carbon as well as the other pollutants out. And by the time you strip the carbon, mercury, and sulfur out of it, you've got something that has an environmental footprint that looks an awful lot like, you know, a renewable. It's essentially got a zero carbon footprint. So two questions. One, you know, as you look forward, what's the cost differential between, let's say you're making electricity at the end of the process. As a percentage, how much more does it cost you to make electricity that using way. this process versus just burning coal in a, say, a modern coal plant? A modern coal plant? A contemporary new a plant? A new one, yeah. Uh, well, I think by the time you add all the bells and whistles on, including the carbon capture and storage in a new plant, they probably have fairly similar cost structures. Hmm. Uh, and that, you know, the, the number I cited for the project in Illinois, which is 120 to $150 a megawatt hour, depending on where you are and the exact circumstances and the exact configuration, they're pretty close. Uh, most, most people would make the argument that if you're going to capture all the carbon, that gasification is a little bit less expensive. Whereas if you're not going to capture all the carbon, then conventional combustion would be less expensive. And so it's a function of, you know, tell me what I'm producing and I'll tell you which one costs more. But if you accept as a given that you have to pull substantially all the carbon out, then gasification is probably the winner. But it's still 
two to two and a half times the price of the existing fleet of assets. So we're going to have to pay more, as Jim Rogers said, for Absolutely. electricity no matter what. If you're going to clean it up, you are, yes. And I've heard a lot about this whole idea of capturing and sequestering CO2. Where do you put it and how do you make sure it stays there? And are there environmental or safety concerns about that process? Um, there are issues. I mean, obviously, it's, it's not a perfected process. But we, we carbon dioxide is actually naturally stored today in formations in uh, the Permian Basin in western Texas. We pull it out. We pull it out every day and uh, stick it into uh, depleted oil fields and extract more oil from them. And the, the, the logical places to put it are oil and gas reservoirs, depleted or otherwise. Uh, those are formations that in many cases have been there for three, four hundred million years, so they've geologically have pretty well stood the test of time. Um, it's not, you know, a zero risk undertaking. But it's also not a, a you know, a carbon dioxide is something we actually ingest, right? We, every time we drink one of those Pepsis, we ingest carbon dioxide. And uh, like anything else, if you get too much of it at the wrong place in the wrong concentration, it's not good for you. But we store underground a whole lot more problematic things than carbon dioxide. And, and I think as, as time marches on and as the science progresses, you know, I think the people that really understand this and who study the formations and look at how they perform know that substantially all of it will stay underground. And you'll have to make sure that there's not little cracks and, you know, old holes that we've poked in the ground and other places where it could seep out a little bit. Uh, and I don't mean to minimize all that. It's a very problematic thing. You've got to decide who owns the oil, the, the pore space uh, under the ground. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, legal and regulatory issues but they're all solvable. You know, if, if we actually desire to take this out of our system, uh, you know, the question you end up asking, is it safer to put this stuff back in the ground or to eject it into the atmosphere? That has a consequence too. And, you know, we're starting to understand better what the consequence of that is. And, you know, I think over time we'll, we'll debate and decide what the right mix is of, well, how much of this stuff does it make sense to capture and put underground? I guess I'll wrap up with just uh, one more question, which is, so your technology is essentially going to provide baseload power, correct? This will be yes. reliable, yes. clean, and maybe affordable. Not so affordable. Not so affordable <laughs> yet. Um, how ca can it be scaled up? In other words, can you put, can you basically get coal out of the ground and gasify it and run plants that generate electricity all over the country, or do you have to be in a place where there's existing oil and gas underground places to store it? Good question. Or, and I, <clears throat> side question also, can you go, I've heard you can go and store it out under the ocean somewhere. Is that true or not? Um, I'm told that you can do that, but that actually is problematic. You know, the law of unintended consequences starts to materialize when you the ocean's the final frontier, and we don't understand it nearly as well as we do, you know, existing underground land-based geologic formations. And so I think there are some very significant questions about tossing it in the ocean, even if you do it, do it carefully. Um, I think in terms of deploying the technology, the most uh, cost-effective thing to do is, on day one, is to deploy it near depleting oil wells where you can put it in the ground and get more oil out. That actually turns a, a liability into an asset because you can get paid for it. So, you know, from an economic point of view, that's what you do first, right? That's the low-hanging fruit. But essentially anywhere where you have geologic storage is a good candidate for it. Now, if you look at a map of the United States, you know, when you look at where, where does wind go and where does solar go and where are the geologic formations you could stick this, uh, you know, most of them are, are in the western part of the country, in southwestern part of the country and you would probably have to pipe the stuff away. So, you know, it'd be a lot easier to produce it in uh, North Dakota and bury it in North Dakota than it would be to produce it in Chicago and bury it in North Dakota. And so it's a, it's a geographic thing. You know, the closer you are to an oil field, the better. But it's not that difficult to put a bunch of it in a pipeline and move it. It's way less uh, 
problematic than moving natural gas or oil or anything else that's combustible, you know. So it's not a, there's not a mm -hmm. environmental hazard in moving it through a pipeline. That's, that's child's play, you know, from a pipeline point of view. Um, so, you know, it will just, that will develop gradually, but you do, obviously, if you're going to capture it, have to have a place to store it or sequester it. So, last question. I know I said the last one was the last, but this really is the last. If all goes well, if we get government policy and you're able to raise the money you need, 10 years from now, how many of these plants do you think you could have operating around the world? Um, well, I think with our technology, we could probably have um, 10 years from now, maybe a dozen plants. I think if you get one or a little more than that done in a year, that's probably a pretty good year's work. These are big facilities. A, a small facility with our technology is a billion and a half dollar facility. Wow. So they're not, even a relatively small facility is a pretty good sized facility. Uh, I think what, what the, the country is trying to do is to get five or 10 projects to scale up and running, you know, in the 2015 to 2020 time frame. Uh, and to provide the incentives that will cause that to happen. You know, we'd like to build maybe one of those. We're not greedy. We don't have to do two or three of them. We'd be really happy to do one. Okay. Well, I think that's a great place to end. We've heard so many uh, uh, exciting stories and plans from entrepreneurs. Uh, here's a bigger company that's also moving in this clean energy direction. So please uh, join me in thanking Rem. And I think I'm going to bring Al back. Is that correct? That's correct. Great. It's, uh, it's my illustrious duty to, uh, to bring, the, bring the conference to a close and to, to bring it to a, to a graceful end. And one of the things that I thought I would do is share with you some of the things that I've learned, some of the things that, that I took away from the conference and, and how the conference impacted me. Because like you, I attended many sessions. and. Uh, I got to participate in, in some of the sessions. One of the things that I thought was salient about the conference and one of the themes that ran through the conference was the issue of partnership, unique partnerships. And it was interesting in the morning session to, to learn about uh, the unique and some of the uh, unconventional partnerships that uh, some of the entrepreneurs relied upon to get their business ideas up and running and out. So partnership is certainly uh, something we'll see more of uh, in the future, I think, in terms of energy and, and energy innovation. And I think that innovation was another big, uh, a big concept that, uh, that I heard today. The idea that it'll take unique forms of innovation, maybe forms of innovation that haven't been studied yet, that haven't been clearly defined, uh, that, will do, that, will, that will help us uh, move closer to solving the energy problem. I think the, the thought that I had throughout the conference, and uh, it's just from me to you as friends, rather than me as an expert, I wonder if there is no silver bullet right now. Maybe there is no silver bullet today, but maybe the silver bullet is in the head of some five-year-old in elementary school or getting ready to go in elementary school, and that through education, through a different view of the world, he or she might come up with that silver bullet. Or maybe the silver bullet is in some mathematical equation somewhere. Maybe it's in some lab at some university somewhere. And maybe that silver bullet wasn't talked about at this conference. Maybe that silver bullet remains to be defined. Uh, and I started dreaming about that and thinking, is it fusion? Is it some chemical reaction that, that we don't even know about yet? And I got excited about that thought, and I got optimistic about that thought, because I know that the answer's out there. It is. It's in that lab somewhere. It's in that mathematical equation. It's in that person's head somewhere, working away at solving this problem. Because after all, many years ago, they told the Wright brothers that flight was impossible that it couldn't be done. And uh, Wilbur Wright wrote this great quote. He said, we didn't know enough to know that it couldn't be done. And maybe that's the way it will be with energy. 
What I want to do in closing today, today and uh, to, to honor uh, a remarkable legacy is to speak a little bit about the Center for Sustainable Enterprise and, and those that were very much involved in it. And the first thing I want to do is to once again acknowledge the founders of the Center for Sustainable Enterprise at Keenan Flagler Business School, uh, Stu Hart and Jim Johnson. So once again, if you'll give them a round of applause for the vision. You might wonder how I came to be involved in the Center for Sustainable Enterprise. It's actually a, a funny story. There was a meeting uh, in the office of the dean of area chairs and uh, key leadership within the business school. The topic of the day was the fact that Stu Hart was leaving the University of North Carolina to pursue uh, a position at Cornell. And uh, there were lots of reasons that Stu wanted to do this. And uh, he had made his wishes known to the dean. And the issue became, what are we going to do? about the Center for Sustainable Enterprise. And the opinions were varied in the meeting. Uh, the first opinion that came out uh, from a unidentified and forever unidentified member of the faculty was kill it. Kill it now. Uh, after all, it's something that we can't replace Stu Hart. We, we are, we're we're going to we're gonna fail in this search. The best thing to do is to divert those resources elsewhere. Others said, well, can we talk Stu back into uh, staying here? No, that was not a possibility. Others said, well, don't kill it, but let's just put it to slow death. Uh, and, and, let's, and let's let it go away. I heard a lot, and I uh, actually went back to my notebook of the day, uh, earlier today, to kind of remember that meeting. And I stood up and I said, of all the things we do, we can never kill it. It's too good of an idea. It's too good of a concept. It represents everything this university stands for. We can't kill it. That's the last thing we can do. If anything, let's invest in it. Let's think strategically about it. And let's, let's reinvent it. Maybe that's what we can do is reinvent it. I went away from the meeting. And two days later, the dean came into my office and said, you're the director of the Center for Sustainable Enterprise. <laughs> And so I went home, and he gave me no choice. He said, you are the director. Uh, congratulations. Get to work. Uh, and I had never run a research center. Uh, I had started companies, been involved in companies, and I'd been an academic, and had sort of prided myself in not being part of the management establishment. Um, that was a badge I wore. So I went home, and I asked a trusted advisor uh, about how to staff and how to approach the Center for Sustainable Enterprise. I asked this trusted advisor, what were my weaknesses? What were the things that I might improve upon? How might I go about this? And so uh, as my wife pondered this question, she looked at me. She says, Al, she says, I'm going to tell you some things about you that, that, that may be hurtful. Um, but you need to know this because this is a big responsibility. She says, uh, you're horribly unorganized. I said, OK, I can accept that. Uh, uh, that's fine. I, I can buy that. She says, you have no concept of time. Uh, when I say it's 8 o'clock, you think that it's in the neighborhood of 8 o'clock. And those who know me know that that's something I have still, I struggle with daily, is the, the concept of time. She looked at me, she says, when I talk to people that have been in business with you and, have, and, and your friends, she said, you have too many ideas. She said, you even carry around an idea book, and I do. Uh, and you write down ideas, and you're just an idea entrepreneur. And that's not something that's good for a, for a well-run organization. Um, uh, you, you have too many ideas, too many things you want to do, and that might not serve you well. So I stopped her there. I said, okay, I get the picture. I think I, I, think I understand this. Uh, and so then I went about setting uh, to, to identify and assemble a staff of people who could help me accomplish what was in the idea book but had skills greater than mine. And the first person I turned to, uh, to that was Katie Cross. Uh, Katie had all the things that, that I never was. Uh, and I laughed, never can be, uh, I, although I try every day. She was highly organized. She was highly professional. And uh, if there was one person that could almost read my mind and, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and get things done, it was her. So I want to acknowledge someone really important to me, not only for the success of the Center for Sustainable Enterprise, but someone who impacted me professionally, Katie Cross.
Uh, along with Katie was Ruth Tolman. Uh, Ruth was good at organizing both Katie and myself. Uh, and is Ruth here? I don't know if she, she, did, she didn't make it. But uh, Ruth was, was very instrumental. Um, Ruth kept a calendar, which was a new concept for me. Uh, she was able to schedule things, and she may be one of the most talented event organizers that, that we had. And, and she served Katie and I very, very well uh, in that process and did very, very well for us. So, so please acknowledge Ruth Tolman as an early innovator. <laughs> one of the other uh, attributes that my wife noted about me, she says, you know, you're too nice. You're too nice a person. Um, that's another problem you have. You like to pal around too much. You like to talk too much. You like to socialize too much. Uh, that's another thing you have. So you need to hire someone who can be more disciplined, who can make students do the work they need to do, and can keep projects on time. So uh, sensing that that was a weakness in, in my demeanor, we hired Kelly Boone, uh, who is the taskmaster of uh, CSE Consulting. Is Kelly here? Did he like really that? But Kelly is uh, someone that uh, really helped bring CSE Consulting to life. This was a, uh, uh, an idea and a concept that Katie Cross had developed and brought to my attention. And uh, we, we brought the right people in to make CSE Consulting work. And that was Kelly Boone. It was all the students and all the businesses who didn't give us just uh, average problems to solve, but gave us the real problems to solve. So a hand for Kelly Boone. Uh, We wanted, to enter, and we wanted to introduce entrepreneurship into the center. That was another initiative. How do we get entrepreneurship as part of the center? The business, accel uh, the business accelerator uh, for sustainable entrepreneurship was an idea that uh, we, we cultivated in the center. We weren't quite sure how to make that happen. We, we played with the idea for, for a while. Uh, Jessica Thomas came in and gave the idea life. She gave it an identity. Uh, she also had organi organizational skills and a sense of uh, event planning that was just absolutely beyond skill. I mean, everybody that I mentioned tonight uh, is more talent than skill. Uh, and she came in and gave BASE the, the needed boost, and, so, and now she is the, director of this, uh, the uh, managing director of the Center for Sustainable Enterprise. So Jessica Thomas, thanks for all you do. <laughs> yeah. Today, the BASE Center uh, is run by Anna Kolchakova, and she does a great job of organizing. She's always bringing to my attention uh, the need for more funding, uh, <laughs> more resources, and uh, she's absolutely uh, taken what Jessica created and has made it uh, one of our rising star, and probably now one of our star projects in the area of entrepreneurship uh, and sustainability. So